Lakers, they fired Darvin Ham after getting bounced by the Nuggets in the first round last year. And then they hired J.J. Redick to replace him as head coach. Now, LeBron and AD both dominated overseas in Paris, but Tim Bontemps still thinks that the team needs help in terms of two-way wings. So, Ramona, what is the main thing keeping the Lakers from contention? Uh, it's just defense in the backcourt. I know they get, they got Gabe Vincent because last year as their, their top free agent signing, and he didn't play most of the year because of a knee injury. But he's smaller, and he's not seen as a guy who's going to be this 3 and D guy with the long arms like Torian Prince, who they let go. And I know Laker fans always like to, to knock Darwin Ham for starting Torian Prince all year, but he's the kind of guy that they needed. Now, they have to hope Gabe Vincent and Jared Vanderbilt, who were injured for most of last year, are able able to come back and give him that foot speed and give him that length on the perimeter because Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell are offensive minded. They were the six worth defensive duo in the backcourt among all NBA guards last year. Mm. Yeah, that's the issue, Ramona. They, the two best guards that they have offensively are bad defensively. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you may see more out of Max Christie, the Lakers biggest investment yeah. in a free agent. Well, I guess you could say LeBron. That was a pretty big investment, but <laughs> was re-signing Max Christie. And I don't think they're going to get defense from Dalton Connect, although I do think he will have an interesting role. But, you know, Max Christie is going to get an opportunity. They believe in him. They want to develop him. Um, and so I think that that's why Bontemps has this on the list. He's not sure about Max Christie yet, but maybe Max Christie will be the answer. The Lakers need that. Wait, the Lakers need a 3 and D wing? The Lakers need a two-way wing? The Lakers can get in line with pretty much every other team in the league, maybe other than the Celtics, the Pelicans, and a few others. Everybody needs a two-way wing. They're so hard to find. They're so hard to develop. And Brian said a name in his answer that I think is very important for them this year and going forward. Max Christie. They paid him $8 million a year. That was $8 million they could have spent elsewhere, an exception they could have spent elsewhere, they didn't. He's an interesting young player. He's a 6'6 wing. I'm not saying he's going to be a 30-minute a game 3 and D guy this season. I'm not even saying he's a lock to beat out Dalton Connect for minutes. But they need one of these guys to develop into something because Gabe Vincent, he's a nice player. He was huge for the Heat. He's undersized. He's not really a wing. Jared Vanderbilt, great defensive player. We've seen it before. He's going to get played off the floor in the playoffs because nobody guards him. He's not a three-point shooter. Someone is going to have to step into this void, or they're going to have to trade those picks they have sitting there to get a player like that. Yeah, I agree with you, Zach, except for how do you do a trade when you're, like, this much under the second apron? Like, literally, <laughs> like, $40,000. And and I think that's, that. you know, we all talked all summer about how LeBron was going to take a haircut to help the Lakers. He took a very, very slight haircut, so they're <laughs> under the second apron, but they don't have much maneuverability. And I still think they need another big man in addition to upgrading on the perimeter. So I think what you got is what you got. I'm Nick Flan, Jalen Brunson's <laughs> wife, Allie, posted a photo of their new baby, Jordan. Shown here so throwing good. up the three symbol on Instagram, just like her daddy. Looks like Jordan might already have also a clothing deal there, too. <laughs> so Jalen Brunson is coming off of a career season, top five in MVP voting. Zach, what will be the Knicks' biggest challenge this year? I don't know if it's a challenge, but the biggest question is, what's Julius Randle's place on this team? He's in the final year of his contract, minus a player option, a couple years down the line. He's eligible for an extension. It hasn't come. The team kind of took off without him when he was injured, but they missed his offense in the regular season. How does he adapt to a role where Jalen Brunson is now ascended to super-duper ball-dominant star? And Julius Randle's not a great three-point shooter. OG Ananobi was a great fit in that starting five. In an ideal world, which I don't think exists, Julius Randle could be an incredible six man playing 28, 30 minutes a game and just taking over with Jalen Brunson rests. But you can't make a two time all NBA forward a six man. So how that piece fits together, whether they actually try to trade him at some point, what they get back to, they just play it out. I think that's one of the most fascinating questions in the league. Yeah, not to mention that extension is they haven't signed it yet. And now you're talking about a lesser role. Like, that's hard to go and like, let's say he doesn't sign this extension. They don't come to an agreement now. Jalen Brunson has already taken less on his extension, <laughs> which puts pressure now on Julius Randle to do the same. And you're going to take a lesser role when you're trying to argue for more money? That's a very difficult proposition for them. Plus, they have to integrate Mikhail Bridges. They have to make up for the loss of Isaiah Hart and saying, I still really like the Knicks here, but 
and, and they need Julius Randle to do exactly the, the kind of game that he has. They needed more offense in the playoffs, but uh, it's a tough position for them to be in. It's going to be fascinating to watch all year. Brian, do you think that the Knicks are currently happy yeah, with their current I roster? I think their roster is a little bit incomplete. They've obviously done a great job, but from an X and O standpoint, they are a little bit short at center. Mm -hmm. um, they lost Isaiah Hartenstein. They have to, you know, rely on Mitchell Robinson, who has been terrific, but he's been a little injury prone. Mm -hmm. so let's keep an eye on what they do from a, from a trade standpoint as the season goes along. There's already been some connection between them and Walker Kessler with the Utah Jazz. Uh, you know, the Jazz are difficult to make a deal with. They have very high asks, but it's possible Walker Kessler could change teams, and he fits nicely about what the Knicks want to do. Um, also, I would say Robert Williams from Portland. I would say any team looking for a center is going to watch Robert Williams closely this year. After the Blazers drafted Donovan Klingon and they've got DeAndre Ayton, who's probably not very tradable on their roster, I don't know where Robert Williams fits. I think the Knicks will be among the teams monitoring him. So as the season goes along, Zach is absolutely right. Uh, we'll see Julius Randle and his role in that contract be a topic. But on the court, how that center position goes is going to be a big topic from uh, week to week as they try to get going. Zach, do you have any concerns about that position, the center, the inside? I, I do, only because of Mitchell Robinson's durability. I think he's a perfect fit for what Tibbs wants to do on defense. He's not as skilled as Hartenstein is on offense. Isaiah Hartenstein's a great passer, a great floater. He's going to be awesome in Oklahoma City. I think Preston Sichua is underrated as a backup center. But look, these two issues can be connected, right? If Julius Randle, if the Knicks decide for whatever reason, we need to move on from him. And one of the reasons... Jalen Brunson taking that below market deal was so big for them is they can turn that Julius Randle salary slot into something real going forward, whether it's Julius Randle on a new deal or trading him maybe in a deal that brings them one of the centers that Brian mentioned. And I think Walker Kessler and Robert Williams III are good names. And I think there are others out there, too. So, again, we project how these teams are going to do based on how they are now. But the season is going to bring a lot of changes, a lot of trades. The Knicks are well set up regardless. Warriors take a season-altering gamble following free agency departure. Chris Paul's tenure with the Golden State Warriors lasted just 58 games, making his departure sting more than that of veteran Clay Thompson. But in terms of direct impact on the court, the Warriors may feel Paul's absence even more next season. This isn't just about their respective performances last year, but about how the team reshaped its roster this offseason. Golden State Warriors are taking a major risk by not adequately replacing Chris Paul after his free agency exit. While Thompson had a more prominent role and averaged nearly twice the points, the deeper metrics reveal something telling. The Warriors actually performed better when Thompson was off the court, and they thrived when Paul was in the game. After Thompson's departure, the Warriors moved quickly, securing viable replacements in DeAnthony Melton and Buddy Heald, two solid options for the five-time All-Stars role. However, when the team waived Paul's non-guaranteed contract, allowing him to sign with the San Antonio Spurs, their response was puzzlingly minimal. Instead, Golden State seems ready to lean on rookie Brandon Podziemski to not only fill Thompson's role but also take on Paul's duties as backup point guard behind Stephen Curry. They also signed undrafted guard Reese Beekman to a two-way contract, but there's no certainty he'll make the final roster, much less become a legitimate rotation piece. What often goes unnoticed is that the Warriors didn't rely on Paul as much as anticipated last season. While part of Paul's value was as an ideal backup for Curry, the two-time MVP remained mostly healthy, playing in 74 games, his highest total since the 2016-17 season. But what happens next season when Curry inevitably misses 15-20 to 20 games, as his injury history suggests? Will Podziemski be ready to step up as the primary playmaker? Or will Steve Kerr be forced to lean more on Draymond Green and Kyle Anderson as makeshift point forwards? Neither scenario is ideal, and it presents a season-defining risk with the potential for disaster. It's not as if Golden State seems eager to solve this glaring problem, either. The players they brought in for workouts this offseason, Bruno Caboclo, Davis Bertons, and Troy Brown Jr., are far from point guards. There's still time for the Warriors to make adjustments before training camp and the preseason, but as it stands, there seems to be a severe lack of contingency planning if Curry goes down or if Podziemski proves unready to lead an NBA offense so early in his career. This could be a gamble that not only shapes the upcoming season but also defines the Warriors' future championship hopes.